ladies and gentlemen, Mary Ann Williams. Those huge 12-foot angels that he painted. 
He painted them and said, every time they make a machine, I will paint an angel. <laughs> they sought to remind us of what was inside. And so what happened is, in many ways, what they predicted and what they warned against. We became, during the 20th century, so mesmerized by the external world that some of the internal musculature, in fact, did begin to wither away. We forgot our depths. We forgot our inner treasures. <clears throat> we all know this. This is not news. We understand that we became so mesmerized and so absolutely fascinated by those things which were outside us that we became imbalanced within our hearts. And so, because humanity, just like an individual, seeks balance, we began to seek through sometimes religious means, sometimes spiritual without being religious, meditation, spiritual practice in whatever way, because we have come to understand that we must concentrate and focus on our state of being at least as much as our state of doing. I once saw some graffiti that said, to do is to be, Hegel. To be is to do, Sartre. Do be, do be, do, Sinatra. <laughs> self-actualization, to seek love and to seek compassion. That's not to say that we're a bunch of enlightened masters, but at least we, to some extent, have the basics now. At least we know what it is that we're seeking. But you know, the devil's hot and the devil's cold. Now, there's a bit about the devil. I told myself years ago, don't worry about the devil, Mary, and that's all in your mind. And I realized that is so the worst place it could possibly be. <laughs> devil out there seeking men's souls. First of all, from a metaphysical perspective, there is no out there. Time and space themselves are illusions of consciousness, as Einstein said. But what there is, is a tendency within each and every one of us to perceive without love. Now in the East, it's called ignorance. Uh, well, I mean that seriously. In the Buddhist practice, it would be called spiritual ignorance. In the traditional Christianity, it's called, it's called uh, the devil. In Hebrew, it means the Satan. When Jesus said Satan, Satan means the secret behind. In Course in Miracles terms, it's called the ego. Many today call it the shadow. But there is a way in which, in this modern conception of spirituality, which all of us are very familiar with at this point, there's so much talk about love that sometimes we fail to acknowledge that force that exists within all of us to actually repudiate that love and to resist that love. You know, the big word these days is mindful and mindfulness. Mindful this, mindful that. <clears throat> I was at, a, I was at a, a conference the other day. There was a lot of talk about mindfulness in business. Mindful this, mindful that. Well, I'd like to submit to you that everything spiritual is mindful, but not everything mindful is spiritual. Only in modern America could we come up with some notion of spirituality that fails to acknowledge and to act on the unnecessary suffering of other sentient beings. And so if we really want to talk spirituality, Buddha would not have ever become enlightened had he not climbed over the walls of his father's compound and seen human suffering for the first time. In Judaism, the deliverance to the promised land only meant something because the Israelites had been enslaved by the Egyptians. And Jesus' resurrection from the cross only meant something because first he had been crucified. So a spiritual worldview does not skip the darkness. That is not transcendence. That is denial. Now the force, the force that runs against love, the force that would have us resist love, it is our own intelligence used against us. It is as it is one form it takes, of course, is the addictive mind. And anybody here, and I would assume there must be some who are familiar with the 12-step programs, their alcoholism is <clears throat> described as cunning and insidious. And in the, East, in the Christian religion, when they talk about the silver-tongued devil, why is this silver-tongued devil? Why is he so silver-tongued? Because he's your own cleverness used against you. But that aspect of self, that aspect of mind which resists love, 
which is out to destroy you. It's like alcoholism or drug addiction. It's not out just to inconvenience you. It's out to kill you. And this force of that which is not love, which lies within us all, it takes not only an individual, but also a collective form. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not just out to inconvenience us, it is out to kill us. Now, this force does not walk up to you and say, hi, I'm your self-hatred. I'm going to not only do it to you, but through you, and mess up as many people as I possibly can. <laughs> as alcoholism does, it doesn't just want you, it wants your whole family. This force does not come up to you and say, hi, I'm your self-hatred. It says, I'm your self-love. It loves places like Sedona. And I'll tell you why. The hot devil would say, go out there and kill people. A hot devil goes out there and says, go out there and make people suffer. That's what the hot ego says. That's what the hot shadow says. Go out there and make people suffer. What does the cold shadow say? What does the cold devil say? Honey, you don't have to think about that. The cold devil just says, you know, it's so lovely here. Let's just talk about love. We don't really have to deal with the fact that 17,000 children starve on this planet every day. We don't really have to think about the fact that a billion people on the planet live on $1.25 and less a day, and above that, another billion live on $2 and less a day. We don't really have to think about that. We don't really have to think about the fact that here in the United States, out of 38 countries, the United States, our child poverty rate is second only to Romania at 23.1%. And we don't have to deal with the mass incarceration issue or anything unpleasant like that, even though we have the highest mass incarceration issue of any country in the world or any country in history. During the 1970s, we imprisoned 300,000 people. Today, in the United States, we imprison 2.4 million. 500,000 of those are nonviolent drug offenders. The drug war in the United States has done more to cause ruin among the people of the United States. Than the United States. It's time for us to have a conversation about micro-spirituality and macro-spirituality. Micro-spirituality is what we've all been working on for decades now. Like I said, you don't even come someplace like this anymore just to figure out how to get yourself off the ground. We're off the ground. We're not dysfunctional messes anymore. For those of you who are, we give you a little time to catch up. <laughs> show up. You know, I believe strongly <clears throat> about honoring our incarnation. And for the vast majority of us, we're citizens of the United States of America. And I guess if you're not a citizen of the United States, <clears throat> I would think anyone else in this room is a citizen of, of a Western or an advanced democracy. Is there anyone here who is not? That means that we have power which is greater than the majority of the citizens throughout the world. One of the things I just cannot bear is when an American especially in the name of spirituality, says, well, all I can do is take care of myself. Uh-uh. American women alone, we could be a moral force on this planet. If American women simply said, that's it, we're child poverty, that's it, that's it. Now. If American women alone, if we said, this business about the 17,000 children who are hungry, who not just hungry, excuse me, who starve on this planet one every four seconds, that stops now. If we simply said that and meant it, and stepped it up, it would occur. You know, I can't imagine a kind of, sort of, sometimes, you know, when it's convenient, committed terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> now, these people are very committed, very convicted, and have made it even horrifyingly clear to all of us that they will do whatever it takes to effectuate the worldview that they desire to see. Every time that there is a terrorist act, either domestically or internationally, the president, whoever the president has been, seems to always call it a cowardly act that will not be tolerated, a cowardly act. And whenever I hear any leader call terrorism cowardly, I tilt my head. Unconscionable? I'll go with that. Evil? I can even go with that. But cowardly? I'm not so sure. The truth of the matter is that hatred has a perverse kind of courage. You know what we need? We need for the lovers of this in this world, the lovers on this planet, to have the same kind of commitment and conviction and courage that the haters have. Because who among us cannot 
say that there are times when, when it comes to love, you know, we're sort of kind of, you know, when it's convenient, committed to love. Ladies and gentlemen, it's so easy to love people that we like. It's so easy to love people who agree with us. I love that in people. <laughs> it's even easy, usually, to love our own children. <laughs> but the love that will save the world is not just the love of our own children. You know, when I was growing up, my mother was a very traditional housewife. Her children were her life, her husband was her life, and her home was her life. This was the 1970s, and I was like, no, I want my life to be more important. I want to go out there in the world and really do something meaningful. Well, years went by, decades went by, before I realized how wrong my thinking was. First of all, there is no out there. Go in, out, that of itself doesn't even have any ultimate reality. But more than that, the more I came to understand, you know, while studying the goddess and the female archetype, my mother was absolutely right. It is a woman's role on this planet to take care of the children, and it is this woman's role on the planet to take care of the home. It's just that we are now evolving to a state of consciousness realizing every child on this planet is one of our children, and this earth itself is our home. Woo! As sometimes, who among us as parents have not had the experience, something happens, particularly if they're teenagers, you know, they come in doing something, talking something, being something, bringing in something, and this fierce <laughs> thing rises up. And we say to our kids, that will not be happening in this house. Do you understand <laughs> It's always kind of funny, isn't it? Because they see that look on your face and they back up and you're laughing inside because actually you don't know what you do with it. <laughs> when it comes to child poverty and when it comes to human starvation and when it comes to deep poverty on this planet and when it comes to environmental degradation, the systematic destruction of our own habitat, the precious world in which we live, it's time for us as a generation, and I believe the spiritual community among us should be leading that charge. Those things would not happen in this house. As I always say, we're not angry, it's just as this shit has to stop. <laughs> now what does that mean for us? Well, it means for all of us individually, whatever we in our own hearts are led to do. But there's a great collaborative venture, I think, which is next. You know, we know as individuals that we have to look at our own, as they would say, in 12-step recovery programs. They would say, take a fearless moral inventory, look at your own character defects. In the Catholic religion, you go to confession. In the Jewish religion, the day of Yom Kippur, or day of atonement, is the, is the holiest day of the year. So the same principles of consciousness by which an individual heals, those same principles are the principles by which we as a collective heal. So as an individual, I have to look at where I've been off. I have to take responsibility for the places where I have been off, and I have to atone for my errors. A nation has to do the same thing. Lincoln said that. You know, it's one thing to be here in Sedona and you look at those rocks and you look at the, it's so extraordinary. And you think, oh, if only those rocks could talk. Well, those rocks have been here a very, very long time. It is actually, however, reasonable to assume that those rocks have seen some of the most noble behavior on the parts of human beings, and they've probably seen some of the most evil behavior on the part of human beings as well, including the genocide of the Native Americans uh, by the founding of the United States. The United States as individuals were really good people, were really decent people. people. You know, Americans are cool people. People everywhere are cool. But as a nation, our capacity for grandiosity and denial is absolutely perilous to our future. It's okay to, to take responsibility. Taking responsibility is not taking blame. It would behoove us to atone as a nation the genocide of Native Americans. It would behoove us. It would behoove us as a nation to atone for slavery. It would be to truly atone for what we now know to have been a huge mistake, which was the war in Vietnam, and which we pretty much have been recognizing for the war in Vietnam. The Pope before this one, well, actually the Pope before the last one, or the last one now, John Paul, in the years before his death, actually had some very, very enlightened things to say, having to do with what he called the purification of memory. He actually apologized for the Inquisition, for instance. Very powerful things that he did. Uh, apologized, uh, went 
to, to Germany. I mean, there were many things he, I remember talking to my colleague, Neil Donald Walsh, Neil said, I think he read my book. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> Things. When he apologized on behalf of the church, and that was before the child's sexual scandal, and it was interesting to think what he, how he might have handled that. But he used this term purification of memory, which was very interesting. He said, and I believe very correctly so, if you do not acknowledge and atone for a mistake in your past, you will not be conscious when you are continuing to do it. It's not just that slavery was important, it's legacy of, 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 of mass incarceration. That is a legacy of slavery. It is a legacy, a legacy of slavery. We have, in the United States, looking at something like Native Americans and looking at uh, uh, African Americans, the African American male has a one in three lifetime probability for being incarcerated in the United States. Just take that in. You know, see, and this is the thing that fascinates me. Sedona, and the spiritual community should be the first people talking about these things, not the last. We should be the last people sitting out the great social and political questions of our day. Because, as I said, if you understand what makes one individual change, and you know that it's not just external changes, it's internal changes. If you know what makes one individual change, you have the keys to what makes a nation change. And for the Latino male, one in six lifetime probability, for the white male in America, one in 17. That is outrageous. And so I think that it's very important. You know, when we think in terms of income inequality in the United States, when we think of environmental degradation and the, the serious environmental questions being asked, when we think of the, the great questions of war and peace, when we think of what to do about terrorism, people don't normally say, why don't we ask the folks in Sedona? <laughs> people don't normally say, why don't we the people who are in the New Thought communities. But in fact, our voices should be the most contributive, not the least. We should be the most powerful in offering the alternative to a worldview which is clearly inadequate to the challenges of our time. Because the basic establishment and dominant worldview by which we make the social, and political, and economic decisions of our time come from such an outmoded view of the world an outmoded view of the human being in relation to a larger moral universe, an outmoded uh, view that does not recognize the interconnectedness of all people, an outmoded view that does not see us as human beings with a mission, and that is to bring harmony where there is no chaos, to bring light where there is no darkness, and to bring love where there is not fear. If you in your life have already, through your own travails, through your own sorrows, through your own pains, found found those tools and found those experiences and had those experiences by which where you used to be weak, you're strong now. Where you used to be small, you're standing tall now. Where you used to be just so at the effect of your limitations, you couldn't even get up in the morning and now you, you have some taste of that which is unlimited. Now, that's not the end. That's not when we all get to say, hallelujah, we can just cruise till we die. No, that's when we say, okay, us, now we will. That is where we should be. We should be contributors. Somebody said to me, they asked me about speaking at a women's empowerment conference. I said, a women's empowerment conference? That sounds so 90s to me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we did that. But that and she said, no, a lot of women still need to feel their power. I said, let me tell you something. A woman, you want to feel your power? Use your power. Some people are saying, I want to find my voice. You want to find your voice? Use the voice you have on behalf of the voiceless. That's how you find it. I'm not saying that every battle has been won by women or by any other group in the United States. But I will say this. We still have, even right now, based on the battles that have already been won for us, based on the freedoms that have been expanded and the extraordinary freedoms that are ours, <coughs> the United States has its problems. There's, there's no doubt about that, and I'm the first person to usually bring them up in mixed company. However, I want to <laughs> It's very important, whether you're talking to a good friend, or you're talking to therapy, or I think talking about this country. Sometimes when you really look at those character defects, and look at those things that aren't easy to look at about yourself, 
It's important to have someone who loves you there to say, you didn't do everything wrong. Just as it's important when we're all on and on and on about how great things are, that somebody's in your presence to say, just need to remind you, you didn't do everything right. The history of the United States is not that we have not transgressed against our own purported principles. We have. And in some ways, I even think we continue to. But the history of the United States is that throughout our history, despite our mistakes, despite our deviations from our own better nature, we have tended to self-correct. We had slavery, yes, but then we abolished it. We did not give women the right to vote. No, we didn't, but then we did. There was not civil rights for major Americans, but now there are. And we are living at a time, ladies and gentlemen, no different than any other generation in the United States, where there are people who seek to expand the self-actualization. That's what liberty is about. Liberty and freedom is about your ability to become that which you are without undue influence or in any kind of limitation. That to whatever extent it does not hurt anybody else, you are free to self-actualize here. That was radical 200 years ago, and it's radical today. But not only are there forces who would seek to limit our expansion, ladies and gentlemen, there are forces in our country today that would like to limit some of the freedoms that we have already fought for. Let us not do that. like great films, great art, meditate, forgive, spiritual practice. We are here to do these things to expand our own inner lives, yes. But you know, we are not on this earth only to expand our inner lives. Love is to be not exclusive, but inclusive. When a Jew wears a Star of David over their heart, or a Christian wears a cross over their heart, both represent visually their symbols for the intersection of the axis of the divine and the axis of the holy. The, excuse me, the axis of the holy and the divine and the axis of the earth. The two coming together. In A Course in Miracles it says, heaven and earth shall be as one. Means the time will come when they no longer exist as two separate states. It says about the great, it, there it's talking about Jesus, but it could be talking about any of the great enlightened masters. The state in which our feet are on the ground, but our thoughts are the thoughts of heaven that we are fully embodied, that we are planted, our feet are on the earth, we're not ditzy, we're here, but we are thinking the thoughts not of what is, but of what could be, of what is beyond the veil, of the world of possibility, not just probability. The probability vectors, ladies and gentlemen, are not good for the next 20 years, either for this country or for the planet. We are on the Titanic and we are headed for the iceberg. The iceberg could be nuclear catastrophe, an iceberg could be weather catastrophe, that, that iceberg could take many different forms. One thing we know, we have got to turn this ship around. If we're only going to stay within the confines of rational, three-dimensional reality and rational thinking, if we only are going to think in terms of probability vectors, it could be argued it is already too late. Many of our friends in the environmental movement are already saying we're just into a, a period where we're talking about accommodation. You know what we need, ladies and gentlemen? We need a critical mass of people who recognize that we can shift from probability into possibility. Why? We have the tools in places like Zendora. And that's why we love. That's why we love pray, and that is why we love. We love because we know that miracles occur naturally when we do. I wrote a book called The Law of Divine Compensation. The phrase Law of Divine Compensation is just a phrase that describes a particular action of the natural order of things. It is a self-organizing universe, and it is a self-correcting universe. An embryo becomes into a, turns into a baby, and a bud turns into a blossom, and an acorn turns into an oak tree. Clearly, there's some invisible force which makes things thrive and survive and prosper. And not only is that universe self-organizing, it is also self-correcting. After the baby is born, something makes my heart continue to beat. Something makes my lungs continue to breathe. And yet, not only is your body or your cells so organized that your body continues to live, but should there be injury, should there be disease, your body is also set up to correct and to heal itself. Such is the universe. So, as the Course in Miracles says, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. We need a miracle on this planet, and we need a miracle in this country. We need to shift out of the normal timeline of three-dimensional reality. We need to, tap, to lift out of the normal timeline of three-dimensional rational thought. And the beauty is we can. 
When we extend ourselves beyond the thought system that is the dominant thought system of this planet, and instead open up to the knowledge that in God all things are possible, in spirit all things are possible, in love miracles occur naturally, but that in anger and in defensiveness and in attack, the miracle is blocked, the miracle is deflected. Ladies and gentlemen, the miracle workers of the world, and that's anyone who is making love the basic practice and function and mission of your life, this world needs miracles. We're not here to watch movies about love and talk about love just so that it's nicer for us. It's so that we can grow into the next phase of, of our own development. And you know what it's called? Maturity. It's called genuine consciousness. My concern sometimes about the new thought and the new, the new spirituality is we tend to keep ourselves a little bit infantilized. Because grown-ups care about things like poverty. Grown-ups care about things like injustice. Grown-ups care about things like end-of-world scenarios. Just one more thing before I close, because I want us to be able to have discussion and questions and answers. You know, us new spirituality types are just as selective of the Bible as the traditionalists are. I love it. And one of the things that we don't like to look at is this thing about the Armageddon. Now, our traditional Christian friends love to talk about the Armageddon. You know, there's going to be this big battle, and the forces of evil are going to fight the forces of, of love and peace. But ultimately, love and peace is going to win, and there's going to be a thousand years of peace. Now, we just don't like to go there. But what if we went there from an esoteric place? Because that's the, the, the point of all the great religious and spiritual stories. They have an internal esoteric interpretation. The esoteric interpretation of the Armageddon is this. For you, the diagnosis of cancer might have been your Armageddon. For you, your divorce might have been your Armageddon. For you, bankruptcy might have been your Armageddon. For you, drug addiction might have been your Armageddon. We have two choices on this planet. You can learn from your Armageddon and become a really wise person on the other side of it. You can learn from your Armageddon and become a really wise person on the other side of it. You can learn from your Armageddon and become a really wise person on the other side of it. I can learn from my Armageddon and really become a wise person on the other side of it. Put your wisdom together with your wisdom, with your wisdom, with your wisdom, with my wisdom, all of which came from our own personal Armageddon, and then we will not have to manifest the collective Armageddon. We will have become wise people. The Course in Miracles says, and I think that this applies to individuals, but it also applies to societies and civilizations and species. It is not up to you what you learn. It is merely up to you whether you learn through joy or through pain. Choose love, we learn through joy. Choose love, and we learn through wisdom. If we do not choose love, we will not learn at all. And when we do learn, it's time to be in the world and to share what we have learned. To share what we have learned in a way that we could not have shared had we not learned it from our own personal experiences. The point, ladies and gentlemen, is not just what love can do for us. As Gandhi and Cain both made absolutely clear with action as well as philosophy, love can not only heal our individual relationships, love can not only heal our personal relationships and even our bodies, love can heal our political and our social relationships as well. It's time to get started with that. Places like Sedona can get on it. Thank you. Very much. Here we go, Marianne. First question. Would you ever be interested in running for a political office? to waste. And I believe that all of us are recognizing 
that something radical might be called for and something completely outside the box since the box itself is so poisonous and toxic. What that means for me personally, I don't know, but I'm thinking questions I have not found myself asking five or ten years ago. Hi, Marianne. Um, I recently uh, got a new tag on my, my business card, Spiritual Activist. I invite you all to become spiritual activists. My question is, I'm lucky enough to work with, uh, I'm, I'm beginning to work with uh, kids that are 10 years old, 12 years old, in that era, area. What would you, besides listening to them first and foremost, what is something that we could say to those children that would empower them even more so than we were ever empowered? It's almost the opposite. I think there are ways in which we were much more empowered. Most of us grew up in what turns out to have been a golden age compared to the age that our children are growing up in. I think that the first thing we need to do as conscious people is to recognize the crisis of American childhood. To recognize the crisis. Um, I already mentioned the 23.1% child poverty rate. There are so many things, starting with the fact that the United States is one of three out of 178 nations that does not have paid maternity leave. We have six weeks unpaid, and most American parents cannot afford to take advantage of that. Why does that matter? We know, we have all the size, sociological and psychological data. In countries where they do have paid maternity leave for mothers and fathers, by the way, it's because the, the, the data shows that if a child is held at the breast of the parents during the first uh, days, weeks, and months after birth, the chances of that child ever becoming um, delinquent, dysfunctional behavior, or any of these other things that are these labels we uh, 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 place on our children today is drastically reduced. So this is an example where that's one of the things that we absolutely should have on the table in the United States and should all be talking about, even the brainwave patterning of a baby. So a lot of times when we think of, of uh, paid maternity and paternity leave, it's not just for the mothers and the fathers, it's also for the babies. Okay? And so those kinds of things have to become this whole holistic thing. Also, before I get off that topic, I think it's worth mentioning, every American should realize, I think, we do not have air safety quality standards. We do not have air quality safety standards in American public schools. How outrageous is that? The respiratory illnesses, it is established that 30 to 40 percent of America's public school children and teachers are affected negatively in some way in terms of respiratory function because we don't even have air quality safety standards in American public schools. This is what happens, ladies and gentlemen, when only money gets to determine the building of political influence. This is what happens. American children and crisis. Now, let's talk about this from a psychological perspective. A lot of people go, I, I, don't, I, I don't even want to look at it because then I feel paralyzed, there's nothing I can do. That's not how change happens, and we know that. You don't necessarily know what to do right away. That's not how growth works. You know, the poet Rilke said, sometimes we don't have the answer, but live with the question. And I'm sure that you don't have to look very far because no community in the United States has to look very far. I don't care how well off or disadvantaged it is. The things for us to be most scared of for our children are everywhere right now. So I would suggest for those of you who live in Sedona, just begin with Sedona. If your eyes are even open to what American children are going through right now in our own neighborhoods, it's very unlikely for any of us that there wouldn't be some way, once you are alert to this, that you might find a way that you could serve. In terms of your particular work with the 10 to 12 year olds, this is what I would say. And I, we talk about this with teachers all the time. Are you actually a teacher in a classroom? Okay. If you are a teacher in a classroom, I recommend this. For you, even if you aren't in a classroom, but how do you work with them? Spend five minutes in a meditative state before you're with the children. And this is true of anything. If you're, if you're an employer, your employees, customers, the children you work with, no matter what our activity, we all are doing different things 
But the form of our service, the form of our jobs is not what matters. What matters is the content. If you're an artist, you're here to extend divine love. If you're a business person, you're here to extend divine love. If you're a teacher, you're here to extend divine love. If you are a salesperson, if you are anything, you are here to extend divine love. With those children that you're working with, my recommendation to you would be to begin a meditative practice where you see, may I ask your religious or spiritual background or tradition? A spiritual, just spiritual without being religious. Okay. So whatever you would sit in meditation and you think about these children. And you think about these children, both those that you know you're going to be working with and those you don't know you're going to be working with. And you place yourself, you close your eyes, you get into a meditative state and you place yourself in service to the divine. And you remember that you're the faucet, you're not the water. You cannot work miracles in the lives of these children, but miracles can be worked through you. So you then allow your subconscious mind, you allow spirit to work through your subconscious mind. You will see luminous beings with their arms around these children, or you will see light around the children. What, the imagery, when you get into this meditative state, placing yourself in service, dear God, dear spirit, whatever, use me that I might be a channel by which you heal these children and protect them from that which they are to be protected from and bless them and raise them so that they are strong and glorious and not at the effect of the limitations of the earth plane, but rise in the glory of the fullness of their ultimate angelic being and nature. You stay in that place for even five minutes, but do it consistently, do it every day, and your own limitations will begin to drop away and expand. And when you're in the presence of those children, you will know things you would not have known, you will say things you would not have known to say, and even in your silence, you will be a space of healing and transmission of power in their lives that they will probably remember you for decades from now. Sedona, if you're not already attuned, and if you want to tune before you get here, you get attuned when you're here. Uh, nobody can, can look up at those rocks and not be inundated with the emanations of the glory and the power of nature. And, pardon? Well, don't you think part of being in Sedona is many people come here to then, for this place to be a platform? This place, then that's really what I'm talking about tonight. It's not for you alone. That's the natural order of things. When the divine heals, it's never for you alone. So whether you are staying in Sedona, like your platform, I mean, with the technology revolution, you can be anywhere at any time sitting here in Sedona. Whether the platform is to help heal the world from here, or the platform has to do with being here, receiving what it gives you, so that you are filled up, and then you go out into the world taking the gift. It's like meditation. You meditate to find out peace. But then you go out into the world and you take that peace with you. And because you meditated that morning, you are a space of greater peace, not only that you hold within yourself as you go out into the chaotic world, but it extends outward from you. So that's the point. Take the gifts that Sedona has given to you and let them extend to you. That's the thing, right? Anybody else? Right up here in the front row of the balcony. Hi. I really appreciate the uh, inspiration and the wonders, so thank you for that. Thank you. Have you, have you by chance found the last six months to be more Armageddon-ish? <laughs> or is it just me? As terrible as some of the storms have been, 
as terrible as some of the world events have been, they actually are nothing compared to what genuine global catastrophe would be. I meant you personally. Oh, me, me personally. Have I done the last six months more Armageddonish? No, but I, no, I have not found it more Armageddonish. I think I had enough Armageddon to last me. <laughs> Experience, and it seems to me and everyone I know I've experienced a quickening. There is a sense, there is a sense, come on, step it up, step it up, step it up, no, no, like, I think where Americans get stuck is, you know there was a, a fam we all know the famous, you know, letter from Birmingham jail, when Martin Luther King was in Birmingham jail, and one of the famous stories about that time is that while he was there, he had very, very close uh, friends who were ministers, priests, and rabbis. And this group of ministers and priests and rabbis wrote Martin Luther King and said, Martin, 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 you gotta slow down. You just gotta slow down. You're just asking for too much too fast. The people can't take it in. And you've just gotta take some more moderate step, measured steps. And Martin Luther King responded with a brilliant critique of what he called incrementalism. And he said that there are certain times in history where if you only go for incremental change, the status quo will co-opt every step. And I think even though Americans, I hear people say this is the 11th hour, but we're not acting like it. I hear people say this is really, you know, this is, this is, or these are urgent times, but we're not quite acting like it. So what I do feel it, it, within myself and with many people I know is that whatever you're supposed to do, it's, you know, many times you say, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Many times we do know what we're supposed to do, we just don't like it. <laughs> right? We say, oh, you know, I don't know, you know, you know, you just don't really like it. Or you go, well, maybe God will change his mind, maybe God will change his mind, and then we go into maybe later. And I think that's the message of this moment. Whatever it is, you do know, and it's not later, it's now. <laughs> that had been uh, sponsored uh, many years uh, through many congressional seasons by a former, now former Congressman Dennis Kucinich. And it has now been taken up by uh, <laughs> Congressman Barbara Lee in the North Bay of San, uh, San Francisco area, uh, North Bay. I'm not sure if she's open. It's right in the Bay Area anyway. It's now called the Department of Peace Building. I think it's HR 808, and I think it's extremely important. Having said that, however, I, I do want to drive home what I said before. The undue influence of money on our political uh, uh, functioning is the cancer underlying all the cancers. So until we deal with that through uh, public financing and hopefully a constitutional amendment to override Citizens United, uh, there's these other things that are Hi, I'm from Canada, and I was one of the people at the beginning of the Greenpeace movement. And um, I often thought what you'd think of, like, we can't fight without clean air and water. We can't hate each other. We can't do anything unless we have clean air and water, so I would like that to be incorporated in a spiritual life. Thank you. Making that statement, right? Yeah, I agree. And you know, there's all this talk, you know, people know that wars of the future will be fought over water. Water, it's one more area, isn't it, where we know, but we're not quite caught up in acting on what we know. Canada knows a little more than we do. Although the pipeline, hello. <laughs> And I'd like to thank you all for being here for this amazing and holy instant and many, many more to come. It's such a powerful time in our world right now. And I'm so excited and I'm so thankful and overjoyed that you're here, that you continue to inspire so many, uh, that the youth in our world at this time have access to such wisdom, such technology. It's going to absolutely blow our minds. How brilliantly they are going to be saving our asses. There is no time for us to wait for them to save our asses. Thank you very sincerely. It's a huge masqueraded pop-out for this generation. There, you know, younger people, it's like those of us who are women, you know, younger women are needed because you can bear children. 
and for those who feel moved to do so. And this, and this species absolutely cannot continue if, if young people do not produce babies. But at this point, at least as important as producing more babies is producing more wisdom. And those of us who can no longer produce physical babies need to be producing some of the wisdom that comes from the accumulated experiences that we have had. And we can't play it on them, oh, they'll do it. Uh-uh. Them together with us. Great to see you here in Sedona. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about the film industry a little bit. And yes, indeed, you know, young people are going to be a tremendous resource in terms of technology. But I'm frightened because so many of them are being taken in by the, the violence and the, the guns and, the, and the, the negativity in films today. And, you know, and that's, of course, the first place money pours in to blockbuster violent films and, and I see my nephews and my neighbor's kids um, no, the film industry yeah. is a place where you really do see the best and the worst that America has to offer. Uh, you see what you're talking about, the gratuitous, gratuitous violence and gratuitous sex and gratuitous sex is emotionally violent and violent towards women. It's there, but it's also a golden age today in American film and American television, too. And um, some of our greatest geniuses in this country are making gorgeous films, and it's, as you're saying, in too many cases, not able to get them uh, funded. So uh, take your message uh, to Hollywood. I know there are, uh, there are people in this business, of course, Sebastian Siegel is here, Francis Fisher is here, uh, perhaps others who are active in that community, who I know, along with others, are doing their absolute best. Uh, to take a message of greater enlightenment and peace. You see it in our films, but you're absolutely right. You see a lot of the other as well. But uh, this is the great uh, moral contest that is going on in American society today. It's very clear what's happening in Western civilization. We must transition there. We must transition from ordering our society along economic principles to ordering our society along the line of humanitarian principles. We need to rediscover what in generations before us, more people were, were called within themselves to consider on an ethical basis. Some things you don't do, no matter how much money it will make, because it's the wrong thing to do and it's the wrong money. <laughs> From a new conversation, and that's what that's what's happening with things like this. I know there are many things going on here tonight, so I don't want to hog time. So I want to ask one. Okay, okay. Um, uh, this is more of a question, but more common. I speak for the youth of my uh, age today. I'm 30 years old, and I grew up in the age of technology. And I would like to say that, uh, speaking for myself, I would like for all of us to get out of the narcissistic uh, uh, state that we're in and be more open-minded to the youth of the United States and, and also the uh, elders. And then we've got to close that gap between uh, the youth and the elders. We've got to know the wisdom that uh, has been uh, learned through the years. And also, that, uh, more importantly, rather than to seek um, trying to feed everybody else around the world, we need to feed our own homeless. I mean, my God, the uh, homeless person is uh, sick and loving. Yes, you, you started good. <laughs>
Right. But it's yeah. just that let's be really remember the facts. Well, realistically, I just wish that we could get out of our narcissistic state and, and more look to the fact that we can help us. Okay. This is the deal. We have hunger in America. We have serious hunger in America, but we do not have starvation in America. And most of the people who stand for feeding the starving abroad are also the same ones who are standing for feeding the hungry here. And one thing interesting, you're talking about the older and the younger. I have to tell you something. I'm surprised to hear you know you're 30. You're the very tip of the millennials. But you, what you just said is interesting to me because most millennials speak in global terms. Most millennials, and that is what's so wonderful about them, speak with an absolute realization that there is no difference between the suffering of an American and the suffering of anyone anywhere else. We are one people in this country.